Hi, I'm going to make this brief. Uh, my name is Scott Rubenstein. My wife, uh, Holly, and I own the clubhouse, and we're just very honored and uh, appreciative to David Hillman. David uh, called me, said, Scott, I have an idea to something I'd like you to do. I just said yes. And if you know David, he doesn't ask much of people, so if he asks you, you don't even ask why. And uh, when I found out what this was, I was even more pleased to be involved in it. As appropriate as it is today to be involved, we had a, uh, we have a sound technician who's wonderful, who lives up the island like everybody else does these days. And uh, he's not here. And because he's not here, we have this beautiful sound system with remote mics and this and that and everything else we can do. My wife had to run out and buy a new system so we could have for here. <laughs> now, in the old days, you'd be a little upset with him. You would tell him we really need to sit down and talk. But in the new days out here, you'd say, no problem. I, I know um, Matthew Lowndes said it at LTV. I said it as well as anybody. All these other issues won't matter if people aren't living here. They're, they become irrelevant. And uh, the town has done a great job. And again, to get back to David very quickly, and I know I said I'd be quick, is this is not political, OK? Republicans and Democrats all have housing problems out here. And what's nice to see is uh, the Vance Goyaks and, and Sylvia Overby and our council people and Tommy from uh, Ciavoni from Southampton here as John Q. Public, okay? They put in a lot of time during the week. This is not a sponsored event by any party, but they took the time because they want to hear what the constituents, what the public is saying, because they have a lot of decisions to make. And I'm very appreciative and very happy to see you here, and I thank you for coming. Um, I know I'm going to introduce them. Let, let me just do quickly get the names. I apologize. I'm getting old. All right. Uh, Pamela. Pamela is the assistant manager of Provisions National Foods. I know you have the same issues I have, and uh, I'm sure you'll speak about that. And uh, Katie Casey is, um, you know, executive director of East Hampton Housing Authority. And Kathy Burns uh, over there at Windmill and, and uh, St. Michael's where my mother is, very blessed and fortunate that my mother is down in St. Michael's, a very thank you and very fortunate for that. And I leave Fred for last, okay? We all know Fred. Fred was a Democrat, Fred was a Republican. Nobody told him what to do. He did what he thought was right, <laughs> always what he thought was right. And if those parties didn't like it, he made his own party and, and still won. He's been doing it forever. But the reason I want to bring up Fred is 36 years ago, Fred was my attorney on this property when I looked at buying it. Uh -huh. And he stood by me, and I ran out of money, and he didn't run out of hope, and he stood by me and helped me through the process of obtaining the property. Uh, so there's a long history with Fred <laughs> and, and this building right here. And with that being said, turn it over to Michael. Michael, nice to meet you, and thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much, Scott, and, and I really want to thank uh, Scott and his wife, Holly, for opening up their establishment for this event. So we really, really appreciate it, and, uh, you know, thanks so much for the hors d'oeuvres and the drinks and everything else, and hopefully we'll all stay and have a few drinks at the bar too afterwards. I certainly will. Afterwards. But, um, so uh, I'm, I'm Mike Kogler. I am uh, the vice chairman. I'm uh, buying you guys all the drinks, so if you want to drink, I'm buying everybody I've been involved drink. in Thank East End politics now for, I guess, about six, six plus years. Uh, for, uh, I guess, four and a half, five of those years, I was a member of the Southampton Town Democratic Committee. Uh, but I live on the east side of Division Street in Sag Harbor, so I'm actually an East Hampton Town resident. Uh, so uh, about a little over a year ago, I decided to, to sort of um, defect from the South. Man Sorry, Tommy John. Didn't really <laughs> I love you, but <laughs> uh, defect and move over to the East Hampton Town side. Uh, so they asked me to... Uh, with um, David Hillman and Gene Frankel and Thomas Crouch uh, to get, you know, to, to help get the word out and get the vote out uh, for this housing initiative that East Hampton is doing. And, um, you know, of course, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for 
Fred Thiel and, and the bill that uh, he and Anthony Palumbo, a bipartisan bill, got through the state legislature. So, so, so with that, why don't we, before we jump right into the panel, why don't we do just a quick round of introductions, maybe Fred? Sure. Everyone knows you in here. Uh, hi, I'm Fred Thiel, and I'm the state assemblyman for the 1st Assembly District. And the 1st Assembly District will include, uh, in the new district, uh, all of East Hampton Town, all, most of South Hampton Town, not all of South Hampton anymore. I'll have the town of South Hall, a little bit of, of Brookhaven, and finally, I just left there, the independent nation of Shelter Island is also in my district. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Burns. I'm one of the co-managers of Windmill 1, Windmill 2, and St. Michael's Housing. And I've been fighting for the right for housing for people for 35 years. Good evening. Thanks for coming. I am Katie Casey, the Executive Director of the East Hampton Housing Authority. Authority. Prior, prior to, to, prior prior to, to that, that uh, actually, actually I worked work for the town, town for 12, 12 years in the Office of Housing, of housing and Community, community Development. development. So coming, coming up, up on 25 years, I'm right behind you. <laughs> I don't know if it's long enough. Hi, Hi. My, my name is Pam Gregg. I am assistant, um, assistant work at both the Sack Harbor and the Watermill stores. And I, um, my main purpose for being here is because I lived in Southampton Town for 27 years. And um, I no longer live there. I moved to Riverhead last year because I could no longer find an affordable place to live. Uh, as I said before, this this, this a, a, initiative or the initiatives that are taking place right now in the towns on the East End would not have been able to happen if it wasn't for this bill uh, put through the legislation and passed into law. So um, why don't we start off with Fred? Maybe tell us a little bit about the history. Um, you know how you put this bipartisan bill together. Uh, what some of the issues are on the East End that sort of, you know, sure. prompted you to do this? Well, first, first of all, thanks for, for putting this all together, and thanks to the clubhouse for, uh, for hosting us tonight. And uh, it was nice to see Scott and the long history that we've had, you know, uh, with this property. Uh, before I get to the, to the bill, when, you know, when Scott said, uh, you know, this isn't political, and it isn't, it's, it's about people and it's about housing, but it always reminds me of an East Hampton story that, that I know people will know this and appreciate it. But I used to be the planning board attorney in this town, and I was at a hearing once, and somebody got up, uh, I think it was about motels on Three Mile Harbor, and said, this shouldn't be political. And uh, Stuart Vorpal, mm -hmm. if you, a lot of you know Stuart, but the late Stuart Vorpal, you know, saunters up to the microphone and says, Politics is in everything but very deep sleep. And, um, and uh, as only Stuart could. So, um, so politics is in everything, but this is bipartisan. And as, as uh, Michael mentioned, uh, Senator Palumbo sponsored this in the state Senate. Uh, I sponsored it in the assembly. It got a bipartisan vote. And, you know, really, why do we need this bill? Why did this bill come about? How did it all evolve? And it, and it starts really with the need. And you know, there are people on this panel that are, that are better equipped to give you statistics uh, about uh, the demand for housing, the shortage for housing, you know, how many units we would need to fill the, the demand that's out there. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it from a more you know, personal point of view, and that is, you know, when you look at the need, you know, you don't need a report, you don't need a study. All you need to do is walk down Main Street on any given day and walk through the business district and see how many help wanted signs you see uh, on Main Street in any village or hamlet on the East End. Or go and talk to Bob Challoner, whose video we've been showing here, and let him tell you about the two to three hundred vacancies that they have at Southampton Hospital. Uh, because they, they can't find people to hire because people can't afford to live here and people don't want to uh, make the trip anymore. Or East Hampton School District, which is you know, looking at doing, you know, providing housing themselves just to be able to attack, 
uh, attract teachers here. Housing has been an issue for a long time. And as I said, it's about people. It's about nurses, it's about volunteer firefighters, it's about ambulance workers, it's about small business people. And basically, it is an issue that is going to change the, the economy and change the character of our community if we don't do something about it. And so the need is where we started with this, and, and that is there's an overwhelming need. And the pandemic has brought it to crisis proportions because we have a great quality of life out here. I've talked to many people just today who told me they came out here because of the quality of life. And they came out in droves during the pandemic to be someplace that was safe. And you know, it's, it, it's a good thing when, somebody, when people think your community is a safe place. But there were consequences. And that you know, the ability of people who can afford the second home be able to afford a second home, to be able to outcompete locals who need a first home, has really been the issue that we're dealing with. So now we, after the pandemic, we have less supply, we have higher prices, and, it's, and we need this bill more than ever. Um, and you know, when I look at it, what, what, who we're trying to help, people ask me, what's the definition of, 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 of affordable housing, who you're trying to help? And I could give you income, levels that are in the bill and purchase price limits and all of that and maybe Katie will talk about that. <laughs> but, but to me, uh, affordable housing and how I, I like to define it is two ways. If you grew up here, if you've lived here all your life, you know, you went to school here, you should have the choice of being able to stay here. And second, if you work here, you should be able to live where you work. And so that's what we're aimed at. Um, you know, the, the, the families and, and the people who help to build this community, who want to be able to stay here and enjoy our quality of life, but, but are having difficulty doing it. And then the people that work here, you know, whether it's the teachers in the school, or the nurses in the hospital, or somebody who's working on Main Street and one of the local businesses, and we're gonna hear about that. You know, you should have that choice. You may not want to stay here, but you should have that choice. And, you know, that's really what this bill is all about, meeting that need so that people that, that grew up here or people that want to work here can live in our community. Thanks, Fred. Thanks. That's a great perspective. On that. So um, why don't we move to uh, Kathy? So, so you, you've been the... Um, You've been involved with the Windmill Housing Development Fund for many, many years and have a unique perspective on, on this issue. Um, maybe you could give us a little bit of an overview of, of what you're doing there and what you see as some of the issues and how this referendum, how this initiative in East Hampton can help to solve some of the issues you're facing. Thank you, Michael. So one of the things that's been really great for me is I have been able to work in affordable housing and see the joy on people's faces when I tell them, now that you're here, you're here for life. You have a home. There's no more insecurity. And to see that person take a deep breath and say, thank God, thank God I can finally have a place where a roof over my head and I am not living on someone else's couch. I deal with senior citizens. Having a senior citizen come through the door and say, I've been sleeping in my car for the last few weeks. It's heartbreaking. And I get calls like this every single week. We have 130 apartments. We have over 250 people on each one of our lists because they're separate lists. So this initiative would help us so much because right now, the way we're trying to solve our issue is we're going up on our housing. So we want to put a second story onto our oldest complex. And I'm hoping with these funds that we're going to be able to reach out to Fred and the committee and say, you know, can you help us? Can you give us funds for this? Because all of our funds come through grants. I'm run by a private um, board of directors great people they all volunteer they all live and work in the town of east hampton and they all have a stake in this and each one of them wants to see more affordable housing in the town in my situation what michael was referring to as being kind of a special one 
when I first lived out here, my husband and my two children, they're 17th generation Bonnikers. And when we first lived out here, we were moving away because we couldn't find anything. We couldn't even put an apartment over the garage, which now, thankfully, the town allows that. But my in-laws were able to put an apartment there, but we were told no. So we were moving away, and I'll never forget, we came back, and there was an answer, there was a message on my answering machine saying, hi, you were picked for the lottery for Whalebone Woods. I can't tell you, Whalebone Woods is in East Hampton, if folks don't know that. Um, and I can't tell you how that made me feel. And that helped us stay. And then I got my job. And so every day, I am changing lives for people in the best way possible. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's uh, bring Katie into the conversation. So Katie, uh, so you're the, um, you're the executive director for the East Hampton Housing Authority. So uh, you have been doing this for many years as well and have a unique perspective on this. It's slightly different um, from, from Kathy's perspective, but you know, very similar issues. Maybe you could sort of talk a little bit about that and compare and contrast what you're seeing with what uh, Kathy is saying. Sure. Um... So maybe I'm getting a reputation as a statistics geek? <laughs> <laughs> you have the numbers. I depend on you. OK. Uh, the East Hampton Housing Authority currently has four properties. We have 130, coincidentally, as well. Uh, in the process of building a fifth rental property, the housing, hey, the housing authority doesn't do home ownership, but the town does. And I also worked in that capacity. Um, I'll, I'll give you a number. Um, in 2020, we did a, um, you know, we surveyed our lists. We had just under 300 people on the waiting list for, uh, for the 37, um, for the, sorry, for the uh, three properties we already had. This is when we were uh, getting ready to select tenants for Gansett Meadow in Amagansett, which is only 37 apartments. At that time, we got 700 applications for 37 apartments. Mm. And then that COVID thing happened, and now we have well over 2,000 people on our list. So it's almost tenfold in two years. So, um, the, uh, when I speak to people about what we do at the Housing Authority when we're proposing a new project, we have to go before the planning board just like anybody else. We, we have to get it approved. We have to submit, you know, we have to adhere to setbacks and density and, and all of that. The most common um, opposition, if people have trepidations about community housing, it's because they're afraid it's going to increase the population. They're afraid we're bringing people in from the outside, the from away. Um, and our properties, on average, when we first lease them up, that's when you can look at their zip codes. Where are they coming from? On average, 90% of them are from East Hampton. And our funding comes from the county and the state and the federal government. And yet, our population in our properties averages 90% from one of the five East Hampton zip codes. So um, the thing about this half of 1% um, is the funds are being raised locally and it will be controlled locally because each municipality is gonna write its own plan. They're gonna decide how to spend the money, what percentage of on, on ownership, down payment assistance, banking land, building rental properties, repurposing other properties, buying um, interests in life estates or living trusts. There's so many different things that we could do with this, but it's locally raised funds to benefit local folks. I can't say it any more simply than that. And, and, that's, and that's a great way to uh, segue to our next panelist, who's Pamela Grinka, 
uh, who's who's going to tell you a little bit, a um, little bit of a personal story and why why this issue is so important for the town to address. Thank you. Um, so I am an assistant manager at Provisions in Sag Harbor, and just a couple of things related to that. A couple of days ago, we were supposed to have a, a little phone call, the five of us planning call, and I couldn't make it because. I, I couldn't make it to the little call we had a couple days ago because besides myself, there was only one other staff member in the store. And we were busy, so I couldn't leave the floor to, to take a phone call. And then another point I wanted to make about being in the store, you know, there's a bulletin board outside the door, and in the spring, it was actually heartbreaking to see how many notes went up on that bulletin board saying, I'm a single mom, I grew up here, I've got one child, we need a house, we need a rental, we need an apartment, we need a room. There were so many of those that it just, it broke my heart, and um, because I've been there. <laughs> um, I moved to Southampton in 1994 because I opened a little organic food cafe there, and I was um, there for 20, it was in Southampton for 27 years, and during that time, I moved about 11 times, so on average about every two and a half to three years, I had to move. Um, at the whim of the landlord, whether it was, well, my daughter's, you know, my daughter wants to, to move in or have, have this for her summer house or, um, there are myriad number of reasons, but there were a number of landlords who never returned my security. Um, there was one landlord who showed up at my, at the house when he, I wasn't supposed to have be moving out yet. He showed up with a van and two men to move me out. And I, I was still actually recovering from cancer surgery at that time. So my story is just one of so, so many. Um, I'm not alone in this. And people are dealing with the, the you had mentioned housing insecurity. It's a very stressful situation to be in, to not know if at the end of your, uh, my, the lease that I have in Riverhead right now, it renewed in July, and I was just waiting with bated breath, you know, am I going to get renewed? Um, how much is it going to go up? How much is the, the rent going to go up? So it's a very stressful feeling to be living with that kind of housing insecurity. Um, my daughter, who doesn't look at me anymore, she's grown, but she is an EMT and she was working, she was volunteering in Southampton Village Ambulance and she was working at Southampton Hospital, but because she's moved now to Shoreham, she's no longer working at Southampton Hospital or volunteering on the Village Ambulance. And so that's one more person that, uh, or one less person that each of those entities has to count on. And. Um, during, during that 27 years, I wanted to say that in 2015, the landlord that I had decided that, um, because we were at that point on a month-to-month -month rent uh, lease, and so she wanted us out at the beginning of May. And anyone who's lived here for any amount of time knows that you're not going to find anything in May. So we ended up being homeless at that point. I asked a friend of mine, a coworker, if I could stay with her for three months, my daughter and I. My daughter was a senior in high school then. And um, she, she said we could stay. I figured we'd be there for the summer and we'd be out by October. But those three months turned into a year and a half because I was not able to find, find a place to live. And it's, it was just a struggle and the rent has gone up just, you know, so rapidly that incomes, even though I make a, a very decent salary at my job, incomes are, are not keeping up with the, the increase in rentals. And um, let's see, I think I, I've said enough. <laughs> I, can, I could go into more, I could go on and on about stories, but um, here's a, paints a picture. No, no, that's that, that's great. It, it really, it really, uh, what 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 Pam Pamela just spoke about really um, puts a lot of context in in you know and, and you know personal you know difficulties that you've had and so many other people have had in the town. Uh, you know, this is um, you know p putting a face with the problem. You know, really, you know, is very very important. Um, so. So we have a couple of minutes left on the panel here, so I'm just gonna 
you know, follow, ask a few follow-up questions. And then we're also going to open up for Q&A. Um, and I know we have some folks here from the Vote Yes uh, for Community Housing Group, Michael Daly over here, and I believe Melanie as well. Uh, so hopefully they'll say a few words um, once, once, you know, once we're done um, and we start the Q&A. And of course, if you have any questions for any of the panelists or any of them, please feel free to come up and, and ask as many questions as you want. That's what we're here for. We're here to uh, inform you on, on the referendum. We're here to encourage you to tell others to vote for the, for the referendum. Uh, we have lawn signs. Uh, this is really kind of a, a get out to vote um, informational session. So, so with that, um, you know, I, I know Fred. You just came back from an interesting uh, meeting in Shelter Island, right? The Shelter Island, um, and I guess not, not. Not everybody. Not everybody is is for this, right? So, so you know, what do you say to someone? Like, what is? What are some of the things that you're hearing as far as pushback goes? And how, you know, what do you, you know? How do you address that? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm, you know, I just came back from Shelter Island. Uh, Michael was there for a while also as a forum, you know, and, and there was, you know, maybe it was 50-50 in the audience, I think, you know, or thereabouts. Um, so, you know, the kind of the shorthanded way that I explain this is, you know, 25 years ago, we put the Community Preservation Fund on the ballot. It passed with uh, almost 70% of the vote across the five East End towns. We added water quality in 2016, had another referendum, got almost 80% of the vote, and now we're, we're dealing with the issue of affordable housing. And kind of the shorthanded way to explain this is that everybody would love to live next to a nature preserve. Not everybody wants to live next to affordable housing. And, uh, you know, the opposition, you know, that at least the, what, I think what, some of what we heard on Shelter Island is, you know, that, you know, there's not enough information in the town's housing plan. Uh, we should be exploring other options. Uh, let's wait a year. Let's do more work. Um, and listen, there's, nobody ever says what's really on their mind, right? There's always a hidden agenda with regard to housing. Uh, we don't want those people here is usually what it comes down to and you can fill in the blank about who those people are but it you know it, listen there so you, you you know you get that opposition that it, that is built into this um and you know my you know my my response to that is you know especially as somebody who grew up here and lived here has lived here all their lives is that you know we did a great job with the community preservation fund the towns have done an outstanding job more than 10,000 acres have been preserved. We have preserved farmland. We have preserved wetlands, open spaces, historic structures. We have created a great quality of life here. We are protecting water quality. But community character isn't, isn't protected, and we haven't uh, done our job unless the people who built this place who, who have been here for a long time and who work here, if we can't have a balanced community where we're providing housing opportunity for all, everybody who lives in this community, we have failed. And uh, I, I want to point out also, you know, just in this answer, that, you know, the town of East Hampton, we've got town representatives here, the town of Southampton, we've had we have, uh, representatives here from the town, uh, Katie, uh, you know, uh, Kathy, you know, uh, you know, with Whalebone Woods, all these people are doing a tremendous job in, in shepherding these projects through and to provide housing opportunities. But just like the Community Preservation Fund, if we didn't have the money, the, we would, our conservation efforts could have never kept pace with the rate of development. We would have been overrun. It would have been Levittown on the East End because that, that's the way it would have gone. <laughs> Uh, it's the same thing with housing. The, these folks are doing a tremendous job providing the housing opportunities, but it's not enough. And the reason why it isn't enough is because we're working with a model that's broken, that doesn't work. The model for affordable housing now is you've got to get the price down. And unless somebody gives you the property, 
uh, for affordable housing. The only way to get the price down per unit is to increase density. And that's why you hear projects, oh, we need uh, you know, 40 units, 60 units, 100 units. And you know, that, is, that is the model that we are using. The problem with that model is it works against other parts of the comprehensive plan. We're trying to protect water quality. We're, we, you know, we, we have issues with highway infrastructure and transportation. And every increase in density threatens water quality and threatens, uh, threatens our infrastructure. It's more traffic. And so, you know, we, we, in selected areas where you have the infrastructure, we can have some increases in density, but you can't solve this problem with that. The other problem with the current model is people don't like it. You know, and you heard about why are people opposed? Well, people are opposed because they bought a house here uh, and they don't want the character of their area to, to change. You know, if they see, uh, you know, they bought a house in a single family neighborhood, they don't suddenly want to see, you know, multifamily housing. So, you know, it, it's two things. One is, you know, it, you know, increased density pushes against other issues that we're trying to solve here, and, it, and it's unpopular. So, how do you do this? I mean, yet, yes, we need some new construction and there's gonna be the need for some density, but the only way that you can reduce the number of the cost per unit is to subsidize it. You need money to be able to do it. And that's what this fund is all about. So we don't have the only choice of increasing density. Maybe we'll, we'll have a little bit smaller project, but it will be more in keeping with the community character. Or we can use the money uh, to provide down payment assistance or, or shared equity programs where people can, you can make existing housing more affordable. Uh, so, you know, that is really why we need to fund, and that's kind of how I answer, answer back to this. And, uh, you know, I will say this, that because of the history in this town, in East Hampton, uh, and the growing history in the town of Southampton, you know, East Hampton Town has been doing housing projects since Judith Hope was supervisor the first time and did things like Olympic Heights and there's been Whalebone Woods and Windmill and St. Michael's. There is a culture in this town where people realize how important affordable housing is and they trust the town board, whoever is on the town board, that they're going to do a good job in, in, in doing those projects. So we're in pretty good shape when it comes to the referendum here. And I think, you know, Southampton uh, is, is, is also, we're, you know, we're pretty good, not quite as good as East Hampton. We have some work to do in Southampton. But, um, you know, it is important, and, and I, the last thing I just want to point out here is, you know, government, when it comes to this referendum, you know, the town of East Hampton and the town of Southampton, they can't advocate for the referendum. All they can do is provide information and educate people. You can't use taxpayer dollars to advocate people to vote one way or another. And that means we have to rely on our community advocates. And I just want to give a shout, shout out because the way we overcome opposition and win this is the community effort that uh, people like Michael Daly and Melanie and Brianne, who is not, not here today, but say yes to Community Housing Committee has been at the forefront, the tip of the spear, in getting the information out there. And I want to thank them because this is not an easy issue to advocate for. Yeah, that's, that's great, that's great. You know, it, 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 to me also, it comes down to, you know, what kind of a community do you want to have, right? Uh, I just looked, I, I just went and um, looked at an open house a couple of, block, uh, a couple of blocks away from where I live and it's on like a half an acre of land, and they're asking three and a half million dollars for this house, which I had, I, it, they probably only purchased it for, um, you know, a fraction of that. Uh, someone came in, a developer, purchased it for a fraction of that, spent the last six months renovating it, and now they're asking three and a half million dollars for this house. So uh, you gotta ask yourself, what kind of a community do you want, right? Do you want, um, these, you know, McMansions up all over the place and no one can't find people to work in the hospitals, can't find people to work in the schools, etc., etc. So that's what I think this is all about. So maybe Kathy and Katie, 
Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit. We, we've heard from Pam. We're putting a face to this with Pam on the panel here. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the people that, like you said, that are on the waiting list. People like the, the woman who was you know, having to sleep in her car for, for three weeks, right? Can you guys put a little bit more of, uh, you know, some faces onto this problem or some situations? Maybe you could give us a little, some more examples. Yeah, I'll jump on that. But <laughs> for, first, I want to say, you know, people talk about affordable housing changing the character of the neighborhood. The character of the neighborhood is changing. This is an opportunity for us to steer it and, and maintain some community characters. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Um, so sometimes um, someone in rental housing works hard enough and scrapes together enough money, maybe is getting help from family and friends to matriculate out of rental housing and buy a house. I'm very proud to say we had two tenants last year who, I, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to, to receive a note that says, you know, I raised my kids here, I've been living here for 12 years, I'm, I'm in contract, I'm gonna buy a house, give my unit to the next guy in line. And so that does have, you know, matriculation. Uh, I love when that happens. So um, our population is multifamily. We do have seniors, but it's not exclusively seniors. There's no age requirement in our properties. For the most part, it's young families, um, the majority of which are single parent households because if you work, you need daycare. And if you, if you don't work, you don't have any income. And even if you do work, your income might all go to daycare. It's like this ping pong game going back and forth. I, I also, it, it occurred to me just recently with regard to home ownership, Fred, you mentioned, you know, limited stock, soaring prices, and we're competing with money from, you know, the city for the most part, right? There's actually the third component of this perfect storm for home ownership is just coming now and we're gonna feel it in the next year or two and that is interest rates. For about five years, mortgage rates were at or around 3%. They're at seven now and increasing. So it makes it that much, like you can, I, I, like I picture, uh, was it Charlie Chaplin? Um, where he's, he's walking against the wind and the thing that he's trying to get just keeps being just out of his, that's, that's what home ownership is for people in East Hampton and South Hampton and South Hold and Shelter Island. Um, you know, it's that, that thing that you just, like when you think you're gonna get a handle on it, the gust of wind takes it, takes it further away from you. So, um, yep, yeah, I, I mean, our, the people that, that, our clients, the people that we house are good people. They work, I recently, uh, at the request of the town, I put together like an occupational sur survey for all of our properties. Who are these people? And I can't, I don't want to blow up their spot. I don't want to identify them. But I said, okay, well, where do they work? What industry do they work in? What businesses do they work in? And they're, um, you know, they're phlebotomists and pharmacists and, you um, paraprofessionals at the school, they're uh, dispatchers at the PD. That's who we're talking about. That's those people. So yeah, count me in. If, if that's who we're talking about, the count me in. Need to run the town. Absolutely. My, my uh, demographics are a little bit different because it's an older group. Um, but the majority of my residents all have lived and worked most of the time in the town of East Hampton, born and raised here. They were the caretakers, the nannies, the housekeepers of all these big estates around East Hampton. Most of them were paid cash, so their social security is so low. The average income at my complex is about $15,000 a year. These people are paying 30% of their income towards rent. 
So you can imagine the joy that they have when they find out that they no longer have to pay $1,000 a month for a room. Instead, they're paying $300, and that includes your heat and your hot water. And they get a utility allowance. Um, I have one woman tell you one quick story. She's, she was 88 when she moved in, and she was working as a potter, and she was collecting Social Security. Her income was very good then, but now she's 94, and she doesn't want to work anymore. She wants to be home. She wants to rest. She wants her golden years, and we just got her onto our Section 8 program, and so now she's, the first thing she said is, oh my gosh, now I can do pottery for my joy instead of for my living, and it was such a joy to hear her say that. And one thing I will say is housing is a right. It's not a privilege. Everyone deserves a good place, safe, safe housing to live in. All right, so uh, I, I think we're at this point um, ready for Q&A. And I think we actually may have someone with the first question. I'd like to also have you include in the people that you're trying to house refugees, people who come here from foreign countries because of political reasons and who work very, very hard when they get here to be Americans and to become citizens and they cannot find housing. And our situation was such that we had someone who worked for us for more than 20 years and we helped him through the process of citizenship and he worked 10 or 12 hours a day and he could not find housing and he had to leave the area and move up to uh, north of Westchester County because he has three children and there was just no place for him to live here. So I'm happy that you're mentioning all these people who were brought up in these camps and but not to let's forget in the United States right now we have a serious problem with people who are trying to come here because they need help and you want to help them. Everything you guys are saying is fantastic and I'm totally with you and on this. But just, I'm a teacher at an organization called Ruta 27, which is we teach English as a second language. We had 75 people just a few years ago. Now we have 175 people with another 60 on the waiting list. And we know our students live in, I have a kid in my class, a young guy, who's a carpenter and he lives outside. He lives outside in a trailer park, but there aren't rooms in the trailer. And we have other students. These are the people who mow our lawns, who do our manicures, who come and clean our houses, their housekeeping. They work at all the Amber Waves and all the other places. And so there is a whole other level of um, people who need housing where they're not getting ripped off by the, and there have to be some rules and laws about that and more housing for them as well because they're critical people in our community who we care about and who want to be, who want to be here. And anyway, that's all I have to say is we can't forget about them. And let's actually hear from Mike Daly, who is um, kind of the one of the major forces behind uh, Vote Yes for Clean Thank you. And uh, yeah, I was relegated to orange juice for my boss over here uh, a few minutes ago. But uh, 
My name is Mike Daly, and I'm one of the co-leaders of East End YIMBY, which you may have seen some of our advocacy pieces coming out, and Brian E. Frage couldn't be here with us today. Um, but I'm also, uh, and, and really with East End YIMBY, we're, we're kind of an educational group, educating people about the facets or the benefits of affordable community housing, but we're also the voice for the voiceless. And I've got to give Pam Brink a, 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 a real compliment today for coming out and telling that story, because it's hard. There's so many, I mean, I know people, and I bet you everyone in this room knows someone, but doesn't know that they're living in their car right now, or that they're living in a basement, or that they're living in an attic, or that their sister's marriage is about get to, to get destro destroyed because her brother is sleeping on the couch and her husband can't stand them. It, and it's because of a, a shortage of housing. But aside from that, I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Vote Yes for Community Housing uh, Committee, along with Melanie Hayward, and also Brian Lee, and also Catherine Zroka, and, um, and also Liz Hanley from Shelter Island. But Fred, I was struck by what some of the people have said today you know, leave it to East Hampton. You're the only crowd that has talked about serving others, other than ourselves. Every other community, right, is all about, what are you doing for us? What is this gonna do for us? East Hampton, you, you're more selfless. I'm sorry I live just on the other side of the town. No, no offense, <laughs> Mr. Southampton, but you know, you're a great community and I admire you so much. But so to wrap it all up here, we had to undertake the advocacy for this referendum. And in order to do that, we had some really good mentors and advisors, and we hired the research team that worked on the Community Preservation Fund. And they did research. Maybe some of them called you, had a telephone interview, maybe you were got by email. But what we found out from that was that the biggest concerns about people on the East End is that our infrastructure is crumbling because we're losing the people who work. Our teachers, our firefighters, our EMTs, our healthcare workers, and then seniors and young people who grew up here. That's in the order of preference, but people are concerned that our infrastructure is crumbling and uh, that's why they support the Community Preservation, uh, Community Housing Fund. And what our researchers said to us too was, you know what, the good news is you can win this. But the not so good news is you could lose it too because it's that fine of a line. So we've been raising funds, we put together yard signs, we put together the mailings that I handed out to some of you today. That's the East Hampton mailing, you get to see it before you get it in your mailbox or before anybody else gets it. We've got them for East Hampton, South Hampton, Shelter Island. I want you to feel free to take uh, some flyers today, some buttons. You can have yard signs. Take them home, please, and put them in front of your houses. If you have a business, please put it in your business window. We can win this, but we've got to work hard and have a very strong campaign uh, all the way up until November 8th. So thank you for your support, really. No, that's great. And, 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 and a couple of other really quick things I want to mention. So this is a proposition that's on the ballot. Uh, it's proposition number three. Um, so what you have to do is make sure you turn over the ballot. You know, you know we have, uh, including Fred, who's, who's running again, I'm sure um, he's not going to have any problem getting elected. But, you know, once you check the box for Fred, make sure you turn over the ballot and check yes for proposition number three. And please, if you can, tell two or three of your friends. Try to get the word out. This is, you know, this is gonna be as much of a word of mouth type campaign as anything else. Um, we have the lawn signs. Take two or three of them and give them to your friends. Um, we can always make more, right? Yeah. There you go, there you go. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things I wanted to mention as, as we get closer to uh, the end of this. I want to just see if there's any, any more questions out there. Does anyone want to say anything? Oh, okay. I 
I was just hoping someone would answer the two questions that were raised about the refugees. Is that something that is not going to be covered in the current bill, or is there a chance something can be done to help those people? So the, the plan, there's a skeleton of the plan. It's aspirational. It's what can be done and it talks about potential expenditures. That is something that can be done. There's no reason why it can't be. It's not prohibited by the enabling legislation in the, uh, that came from the state. And I, one of my favorite, uh, I, my metaphor, I said previously that on average 90% of our uh, residents are, are local. But I love the other 10% because you have to crack the window and let in a little fresh air every once in a while. Yeah, and and the, other, the other thing that we should probably mention just to make sure everyone's clear, right? Th this referendum is to raise the funds for, for the initiative. And then the town of East Hampton is going to set up a board. And, and how many people total are going to be on the board? I forget. Ten, up to 17 people are going to be on the board um, and it's going to be kind of a cross-section of business owners, uh, you know, all types of people in the town and that board is going to decide on what initiatives to, to, to spend the money on. Okay, so it's really, the money is being raised by East Hampton. East Ham this board, which, are, which is going to be made up of business owners and residents of East Hampton, they're the ones that are going to be deciding what to do with the funds. That's an important distinction, right? It's not like we're taking money from the federal government or the state government where, you know, um, we don't have a complete say in how the money is going to be spent. East Hampton has pretty much uh, a complete say on how the money is going to be spent and what initiatives, you know, are going to be funded from this, right? But the first, the first part, okay, is to get the referendum passed, and set up the fund. I just want to let everybody know also, October 29th through November 6th at Windmill Village 2, 219 Akabonic Road, you can come for early voting. It's a really nice way to come in, just do it casually, and no lines or anything, so. Hi, first of all, thank you everyone for doing this and everyone's efforts and the town board for being all hands on, on hands, all hands on housing, all hands on housing. And I'm looking forward to flipping the ballot and voting yes for Prop 3. Um, since uh, Michael and uh, Samuel and Phil, you raised this sort of pushback issue around density that people have, I thought if I might, I just would like to give a little talking point for everyone here to be able to sort of rebut this concern. So I was doing a little math. Um, Ms. Casey and I both love statistics. And I was looking at one four acre parcel that has been subdivided under the Namagansett in a place called Handy Lane. It is eight large luxury houses. In total on four acres, it, rep it is built out 43,000 square feet, 51 bedrooms, all oversized, but if they were in an affordable housing uh, domain, they'd be smaller. 65 bathrooms, plus pools and pool houses and garages. And so I think it's really important that people understand the character of neighborhoods is changing. The density is expanding. And so that's all very unproductive use of our land because it is mostly luxury, second home, won't be used much. So I just think it's a really important thing for people to understand that's going on. It's a separate conversation to say how we deal with that, but this, this funding will allow us to create more productive use of our land and, and also hopefully convert some of our existing housing stock so we don't have to build our way out of this um, with, with those funds as well. So I just wanted to bring those points up. Thank you. Ex excellent points. Great. Um, Tommy John? 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm your neighbor to the west here, uh, Councilman Savone in Southampton Town. I want to thank everyone on the panel and, and for uh, the clubhouse for having us today. Um, to quote your, your supervisor, and I'm going to butcher this, Peter, you know, we studied who needs affordable housing and, and they are us. And, you know, I, I, it's that, I heard you say that and it, it's been resonating in my head uh, ever since. So, you know, I'm asking for everyone here to stay engaged. I am cautiously optimistic that on November 8th, Proposition 3 is going to pass in all four towns, right? We're going to do this. But once that happens, the town boards are going to have to put initiatives in place. We plan on putting code in place and uh, a whole bunch of other things need to happen over the town boards at these public hearings. So please, I am asking you, make it easy for your board, I believe you have a quorum here today, but make it easy for your board to pass these things. Please come to Southampton, speak at the dais, encourage us to do the right thing for housing for people in the community because this is an ongoing effort this is just the beginning, and I see really great things uh, to come in our community. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you. This is just a question about the mechanisms. What was the proposition? How is the funding going to take place? Is it through the transfer tax? And in other words, can you explain a little bit more about that component of the Yeah, sure, about the mechanics. So the best person to answer this would be Greg. Would be here's, here's a future uh, homeowner in East Hampton, hopefully, right here. So there's two parts to the bill, and we've spent a lot of time talk, talking about the first part, and that is the fund itself, what it can be used for, basically anything you can think of. We, we, on the state level, we tried to make the law as flexible as possible, so almost any good idea that somebody might have with regard to affordable housing, the towns will be able to take advantage of, including the really good questions with regard to refugees. Is, you heard the answer. So the other part of this is is this we gotta raise the money to do this, right? So it is we have an existing two percent real estate transfer tax that goes to a dedicated fund for land acquisition and and water quality. And that is a dedicated fund to to quote Al Gore, it is a locked box and it can only be used for that. And what we are proposing and what is on the ballot is to add a half a percent to the transfer tax to be in a separate dedicated fund that can only be used for affordable housing. And the other thing that I should point out, two things actually that I should point out, is that under the existing law, uh, the first $250,000 of every real estate transaction is exempt. Uh, and it hasn't been changed since 1998. And that 250,000, this will give you an idea about where we have, where we were and where we are now. We chose that $250,000 in 1998 because that was the median price of a house on the South Fork in 1998. So, you know, we can't increase it to the median price of a house now because we wouldn't generate any revenue, but we increased it to 400,000. So the exemption is going up also. And when you do all the math on that, it means that compared with the way the law is now, uh, if for real estate of a million dollars or less, you'll actually pay less in tax. Uh, and also there's no exemption for houses that, for, that for, who have to pay the tax over $2 million. Um, so I don't think I'm telling tales out of school here when I, when I tell you as far as generating the revenue. Um, first of all, it's the buyer that pays the tax. It is the welcome stranger tax, right? I mean, the rest of us have been paying property taxes for years, uh, you know, to, to, to build this place. Uh, and we've got a pretty good community. This is the, the, the payment for, the, for new people coming in, buying a second home. 
uh, you know, to invest in this community. And there's a rough justice to that because who's driven? What has driven up prices? What has de de uh, decreased inventory? It is second home. So you know, we need all the things that we said before: firefighters, teachers, all of that. This is the way of folks that are moving into the community uh, to contribute. So it's kind of a welcome stranger tax. And uh, it is a funding source that would make Bernie Sanders blush, okay? Because uh, it is, 90% of the revenue from this tax comes from real estate uh, transactions that are probably over five or six or seven million dollars. Uh, and if you're buying a seven million dollar home in the Hamptons, you can probably afford uh, to pay this tax. The other thing that I should mention also as far as the mechanics go, is that in addition to the exemption on the first 400000 if you're a first-time home buyer uh, that you know qualifies for community housing, you don't pay the tax at all. Uh, so we, we have that exemption there. So uh, if the referendum passes, uh, it, the tax would go into effect the, the, uh, the following April 1st in East Hampton Town. It is estimated here, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but on, you know, on an average year it probably could generate as much as 10 to 12 million dollars a year in, in the town of East Hampton. The other thing that to be aware of also is that the tax will be in effect until 2050. And when you know, we had the Community Preservation Fund, uh, the towns borrowed against future revenue so they, they could protect the land before it disappeared. You know, you didn't want to wait 10 years for the revenue to collect. Now, the, the towns will have that option with regard to housing. They'll be able to jumpstart this program if they want by bonding against uh, the future revenues, which was an idea that looked a lot better a year and a half ago when interest rates were 3% then they probably, it probably looks now as 7%. But it's still an option that the towns would have. Thanks, Fred. Any more questions? Yep. I don't know if it's going to reach the whole way. Hi. Um, at the risk of it sounding like an oxymoron, could you just explain for the folks where the village is? Uh, stand in this East Hampton, Sac Harbor, and Southampton. Oh, oh, thank you. So the villages pay the tax. If you're, if there, if there is, uh, you know, every village is in, in a town, and if you live in the village that uh, I live in, and Tommy John used to live in, he lives in North Haven, but Sac Harbor, you live in two towns or you live in one town or the other. So villages pay the tax, and to be honest, given the real estate market, they pay a disproportionate amount of the tax, because that's where some of the highest values are. East Hampton Village, South Hampton Village, Sag Harbor. So villages pay the tax. Uh, we can't, just like with the, the, uh, the Community Preservation Fund, you know, they're villages. We can't mandate that they, they participate. But they have the ability to. Every town, every village participates in the community preservation fund. They will be able to enter into an agreement with town, the towns, to be to be able to get be beneficiaries of this fund, also. And will somebody, well, we can't mandate them to. But um, you know, talking with most villages, if you look at the village of Sag Harbor, they're already changing their zoning code to try to take advantage of these affordable housing initiatives. Um, and you don't want to be the village government that has to explain why their, their residents paid millions of dollars into this fund and they didn't take advantage of it. So we can't, you know, they pay the tax, we can't mandate that they have a housing program, but they certainly have the ability to work with the towns to be able to do that. Fantastic. Um, any other questions? Or uh, should we adjourn to the bar? What do you think? Motion to adjourn to the bar. I'm always in order. All right. Uh, okay, there's a first and second. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Please get the word out. Tell your friends. Turn the ballot over. Check off yes for number three. Thank you.